Welcome back to our exam preparation course video series and today's discussion is a pulmonary hypertension case. Before we start, we'll discuss today's idiom which is don't count the days but let the days count. That means no matter how many days remaining till your exam, please focus on the quality of your study. Don't spend much time on just one topic while you have one week or two or ten days remaining till your exam. So today's case is pulmonary hypertension. I believe that most of us are weak in such topic or not fully covering. So I picked this topic just to review our knowledge together. So our case today is a case of 65 year old lady uh, known to be treated for pulmonary hypertension coming for an emergency laparotomy and our goals of discussion is definition of pulmonary hypertension, classification, and there is many classifications for pulmonary hypertension, pathophysiological changes, clinical presentation, what are the investigations that you are asking for this case before anesthesia, if it's a cold case versus emergency case, how you optimize this patient preoperatively, what's your anesthetic management in theater, and finally, what is the post-operative and ICU concerns for a case with pulmonary hypertension? Now, let's start with the definition of pulmonary hypertension. Definition of pulmonary hypertension was progressing over the years, and we finished by the WHO definition according to the Fourth World Symposium which says that pulmonary hypertension is a main pulmonary artery pressure above 25 millimeters of mercury. Previously, there was an addition of provided that pulmonary capillary wedge pressure less than 15, which is not there anymore and we will know the rationale when we classify pulmonary hypertension. So, what is a normal pulmonary artery pressure if you say it's above 25? It's below 20, and 20 to 24 is a borderline pulmonary artery hypertension. So, the normal systolic pulmonary artery pressure is 15 to 30, the normal diastolic pulmonary artery pressure 4 to 12, and severe pulmonary hypertension when the mean pressure is above 35, and you expect right ventricle to fail when it's above 50 millimeters of mercury. Second point we are covering here is the classification. Again, WHO classified pulmonary hypertension according to etiological grades and functional grades. Functional grades depends on the patient physical activity. If there is no limitation in the physical activity, in the ordinary physical, if there is no limitation of the ordinary physical activity with a patient who is proven to be a pulmonary hypertensive patient, that's class one or stage one. If stage two, if there is a minimal limitation of his ordinary activities, class or stage three is marked limitation of his physical activity, and stage four, he has severe limitation or even is enabled to do any activity without being symptomatic and we'll discuss symptoms in a minute. Then the etiological classification and this is very important to understand according to the path of physiology and we'll discuss that in the coming few minutes. But grade 1 which is pulmonary arterial hypertension with underlying many etiologies for that. First one is the idiopathic cause and second one is connective tissue disease like rheumatoid arthritis, systemic lobus, rheumatoid arthritis. Congenital heart disease, drugs and toxins like cocaine, chronic use, infections like schistomyosis and portopulmonary hypertension and that's common in Egypt, plus HIV patients have complication of pulmonary hypertension. This all under the category of pulmonary arterial hypertension, and we'll discuss that in a minute. So, grade two is pulmonary hypertension due to left heart disease. Grade three 
is a pulmonary hypertension due to lung disease like chronic interstitial pulmonary fibrosis like COPD, obstructive sleep apnea, any cause of chronic hypoxemia. And grade 4 is the chronic thromboembolic pulmonary hypertension. That means it's a chronic pulmonary hypertension due to repeated pulmonary emboli. And the grade 5 or the last grade is the one unclassified or many etiologies or multifactorial pulmonary hypertension. This is classified as grade 5. So we have five grades and functional classification. As you see here in this simple diagram showing the right heart on your left side and left heart on your right side and between them pulmonary capillaries. So from the right side the pulmonary artery is, le is leaving, is carrying deoxygenated blood in the pulmonary arteries ending by capillaries then after oxygenation of blood at the alveolocapillary membrane it goes back into four pulmonary veins to the left ventricle. So any pathology affects the left ventricle reflected to the pulmonary capillaries increasing the pressure like a mitral regurg, mitral stenosis, left ventricular hypertrophy, aortic pathologies, anything causes left ventricular increase in the pressure this increased pressure will be reflected on the capillaries. Capillaries cannot resist that pressure. As a consequence, the pressure will increase on the right side. So if this is the scenario, we will call that grade 2 or grade 5 because it's sometimes multifactorial. If your pressure is increasing from the right side, which means the problem is in the pulmonary artery or its branches, that means it's category 1, 3, or 4. Again, there's no pathology that can affect capillaries, so it's either left side pathology or right side pathology. If this point is well understood, we'll proceed to clinical presentation of the patient. The main clinical presentation is dyspnea and shortness of breathing in more than 60% of patients. You may have manifestations of low cardiac output due to decreased venous return from the lungs through the pulmonary veins to the left side of the heart so manifestations of low cardiac output like syncopal attacks easy fatigability is the last one and this symptomatology is the one from which WHO classified its functional classification which are four stages as we mentioned a while ago so what are the signs that you may find in a patient with a pulmonary hypertension We'll go with inspection, palpation, percussion, and auscultation, just to make that in a normal systematic approach. The first one is inspection. You can see congested neck veins due to right ventricular enlargement reflected to the right atrial pressure reflected to internal jugular veins, so venous engorgement. You can, by palpation, find tender hepatomegaly or non-tender hepatomegaly. By palpation, you may find pitting lower limb edema. There is nothing you can find in percussion. Per auscultation, you will find pathological splitting of the second heart sound. And if your ventricle, either right or left, are failing, so you will find S3 gallop. What are the investigations you are asking for a patient who is coming in your clinic as a cold case for an elective procedure? then you can minimize for the essential ones in an emergency case. The first investigation, almost forgotten, which is the six minutes walk test. How you classify your patient according to the functional limitations is six minutes walk test, or the METS, metabolic equivalent of a task. And again, refer that to the first table we discussed as per WHO classification. Second is chest X-ray. What you will find in your chest x-ray, you will find right ventricular size enlargement, you may find right atrial size enlargement, you may find that the pulmonary vasculature at the stem pulmonary arteries are dilated, rapid attenuation of the pulmonary vasculatures through the lung field, and clear lung fields. So again, right ventricular increase in size, 
plus minus right atrial pressure depends on the grade of pulmonary hypertension. The stem of the pulmonary arteries is dilated with gradual fainting or disappearance and clear lung fields. These are the chest x-ray findings in a case of pulmonary hypertension. ECG, you may find right ventricular enlargement, right atrial enlargement with a pulmon P pulmonary. What is P pulmonary, by the way, is a P wave amplitude more than 2.5 millimeters. Right axis deviation, right bundle branch block, and if the cause is the left side, you may also find P mitrally if, it's the, if the case is a pulmonary hypertension due to mitral stenosis or mitral regurgitation. The third investigation is the echocardiography. will show right ventricular dilatation, plus minus right atrial dilatation, valvular heart disease, if it is the underlying cause, left ventricle may be the underlying cause, so biventricular assessment, tricuspid regurg, and if you put your pulsed wave on the tricuspid valve, you can measure the right ventricular pressure, and if you add that to the right atrial pressure, you will get the pulmonary artery pressure. What else you can ask for? You, can, you may ask for a CTPA to diagnose if it is C, chronic thromboembolic pulmonary hypertension, if the pulmonary embolism is the underlying cause. So you may ask for a CTPA or CT pulmonary angiogram. And the gold standard in our investigation is the cardiac catheterization. Cardiac catheterization will show exactly the pressures, the flow, and your coronary perfusions also during systole and diastole in the right side and in the left side. How you optimize this patient perioperatively? There is three main items you need to know by heart. First, oxygen is the most potent pulmonary artery vasodilator. So if your patient is hypoxic, just for a few seconds, that causes severe pulmonary vasoconstriction and severe pulmonary hypertension. So that's your real foo or your real enemy. So hypoxia is absolutely contraindicated all the time in the perioperative period. So after the oxygen, I like to classify my optimization goals into three categories. Maintain, avoid, and some medications. The medications we use for vasodilation are, again, oxygen, nitric oxide, sildenafil, which is a phosphodiesterase inhibitor, bosentan, which is endothelial receptor antagonist, and epoprostinol, which is a prostaglandin analog. Some adjuvants in therapy, like, like digoxin and diuretics, are used if there is impaired contractility of the RV or LV to help bombing blood and improve oxygenation. You need to maintain good hydration, left ventricular function, right ventricular function. So your threshold to use inotropes should be very low. You should always maintain normal arterial blood gases in the term of pH, no acidosis, normal CO2 as hypercapnia increases pulmonary hypertension and normal PO2, again as we said, oxygen is the most potent pulmonary artery vasodilator. Avoid sympathetic overstimulation, it causes pulmonary vasoconstriction. Avoid hypoxia, hypercapnia, pain, any stress induced during your induction or recovery, acidosis and hypothermia. Some medications you should avoid in your anesthetic management, like nitrous oxide and ketamine. So nitrous oxide is a potent vasoconstrictor, while nitric oxide is a potent vasodilator. The medications we can use if you have a pulmonary vasoconstriction in the acute event are oxygen, nitric oxide, morphine, nitroglycerin, sodium nitroproside, hyperventilation to wash CO2. Avoid any increase in the airway pressures, so avoid high peeps. Avoid low venous return, I mean hypovolemia, so keep your venous return always optimized. But be careful not to flood the lungs with fluids causing pulmonary edema and hypoxia. So judicious fluid management 
Tachybrady arrhythmias are always contraindicated. So avoid tachy or brady. Maintain normal rhythm. And rapid AFib is poorly tolerated. How you conduct anesthesia for this patient coming for laparotomy? Again, use the invasive monitoring like arterial blood pressure, central venous pressure if you like, and pulmonary artery catheter is spared for those people with moderate to severe pulmonary hypertension and in some references only for severe cases. Avoid and maintain the same factors mentioned previously. Finally, and the last question will be how you will extubate your patient or send him to the ICU. Again, optimize your blood gases, optimize your electrolytes. Pain is your full in post-operative, so maintain good analgesia with multimodal analgesia. And some patients need to be ventilated in the ICU, depends on the surgical procedure and blood gases to be optimized before extubation. If your patient is showing manifestation of pulmonary artery pressure increase intra or post-operatively, again 100% FiO2, hyperventilate, nitric oxide if it's available in your theaters or in ICU. You may use nitroglycerin spray, you may use some morphine and sodium nitroprusside can be used also. I wish you enjoyed this case. Please don't forget to subscribe to my channel and like this video. Your critique is always welcome. Please keep me updated with your feedbacks. It makes important to me. Thank you.